humble. How you guys doing? All right. Wow, good crowd. How you guys doing? Great. All right, here we go. I hate to do a cliche, but I got to do what I got to do, you know? Okay, so we're going to be talking about ransomware and what you can do to prevent it. A um, little bit about who I am, what crypto locker type ransomware is, and why you need to reframe your defensive strategies a little bit. Because it's actually a neat hack on how attackers used to have to do their campaigns. And we're going to talk about some of the advantages that cryptoware has for the bad guys. And that should inform your defense a little bit. We're going to be spending a lot on prevention and detection because, quite frankly, those are your best bets. Once the crypto locker bomb has gone off, you get to play a game of how good are my backups. <laughs> and i got to tell you, from the caseload that I have, um, uh, it, it's not too great. Um, a lot of people have what I call write-only backups, and they can't retrieve them. So um, if there's any one good thing about crypto locker and ransomware style stuff is we're going to be seeing a resurgence in uh, backup technologies and uh, taking better care of that sort of stuff. Finally, this is a little bit of a teaser for a cool project that I'm, uh, I think it's cool. I don't know. You all might think it's silly, but if you want to play with me, you can. It's a tool called Suspect, and it's a closed uh, repo on GitHub. And uh, the main reason why is I'm not that great of a coder, and I have caused local CPU denial of service with this tool. So um, I'm continuing to refactor the code, and we'll get into that later on uh, toward the end of the talk. So a bit about myself. Hi, I'm Mick, and I'm the Digital Forensics Incident Response Practice Lead at Binary Defense. I love where I work. Have a good time. Dave, I said it there. Please release my family. <laughs> Just kidding. It's only my wife. <laughs> um, in my copious spare time, I teach for SANS. I uh, teach a class of, primarily the, the main class that I teach is uh, 504. And um, I've got upcoming events in sunny San Diego, California in October. And then I've also got one coming up in Florida. So if you guys are uh, feeling like you want more mid construction, by all means, uh, swing on by those places. So here's the Crypto Locker traditional ransomware alert. There's different ones that give different alerts. But the bottom line is a lot of organizations are seeing this and all of a sudden feeling that sinking feeling in the gut of, oh no, bad guys are in our network, they're encrypting our files, and we're now being held hostage. And this style of attack came out early 2014. And one of the things that we do at Binary Defense is we do a lot of reconnaissance and threat monitoring to see what the bad guys are doing. And when this came out, I was like, huh, oh, you know, that's a neat, cute attack, but surely, you know, this is just going to be kind of one of those flash in the pan type things because ransomware is really easy to detect and defend against. At least that's what I thought. So the news actually has the real truth because we're seeing police organizations, we're seeing manufacturing places, we're seeing hospitals, we're seeing basically every single vertical is falling to this and it's making me sad. Because getting back to this, I thought that this was going to be a real easy thing to, def to defend against. And one of the reasons that I thought that it was going to be so easy to defend against is that all of the crypto um, cases that I've dealt with, every single one, there has been ample evidence that the attack was underway. There's been ample ways that you could have protected it, and yet people still fall for it. And what we're going to talk about a little bit is how to protect against that. Um, basically, I was wrong, you know? I'll admit it. It escalated quickly, you know? <laughs> Totally, totally wrong. And now, one of the things that I find interesting is um, part of the services that we have at Binary Defense is that we will help um, companies position themselves and make sure that their defensive fabric and their alerting and their monitoring is set up appropriately. And in almost every single instance, we now have clients that come to me and they say, hey, Mick, how do we get Bitcoin? 
And I tell them, why? Have you got ransomware? And they're like, no, 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 not yet. We just need to prep. And I'm like, what? No! Don't buy ransom. Like, don't pay for the ransom. Like, you're helping fund criminal activities. It's horrible. Don't do that. Like, doesn't your sense of morals prevent you from doing that? And they go, mm, yeah, but, you know, we just need to uh, prepare for it. And I'm like, no, don't. It's horrible. Shameless plug, when you do, I would recommend that you go through one of these two folks because they're the ones that most of our clients go through when they're in that unfortunate uh, scenario. Don't do it. Don't pay for it. But if you do, use Coinbase or Etsy because they're pretty easy. So I'm clearly ranty. I'm feeling the pain here. And I'll be honest, I'm a little conflicted because I've got a perverse incentive. You know, I certainly can make a lot of money by cleaning up the aftermath of ransomware, but that's not really the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to fix this issue so that we don't face this. And the really good news, the very good bit of info that I can give you is that this is a fight you can win, and it's actually very easy to win. All you need to do is a little bit of basics, back to the basics type stuff. So why is this sort of attack so popular? Well, it's easy. It gives a lot of capabilities that the bad guys didn't used to have. It's a fire and forget sort of thing. And interestingly enough, this also solves an odd problem that malware authors have. So the attacker problems are this. If you've got a bit of malware, if you've got exploit code, and you're in the business of stealing data and selling it on the black market, you know, I'll be honest, it's a horrible way to make a living. And not just because you're doing illegal things and stealing from, you know, people. It's hard to make money at this. Do you know what the, the black market rate for a credit card is? Cents. Hmm? It's like literally cents. Cents. Yeah. yeah, like if you have a Visa Black card, like a super premium credit card, it might go for five dollars. Might, maybe, maybe, exactly. It's that that's like super ultra premium credit cards. One of the reasons that you're seeing when you, uh, you read these breach reports that are like 11 billion cards were stolen is they have to take 11 billion dollars so they can buy tacos. Because one, tacos are delicious, but two, they're making so little money. Their revenue is very thin. Now, I'm not crying any tears over this, but the fact of the matter is credit cards are a real bad return on investment for the bad guy. A better one is to go after health records. Health records, anybody know what that goes for on the black market? Hundred bucks? Whoa, no, not ten thousand. Whoa, 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 what kind of insurance do you have, sir? <laughs> um, no, a, a health record, if you've got really good coverage, will be around 200 to 250 bucks. Usually we're seeing it though around the hundred to two hundred dollar range. And what happens is the bad guys will uh, bless you. They will buy health records and flip them to people who are underinsured. They, you know, make a fraudulent health card. They get whatever operation or whatever they need done, and then bingo, bango, bongo. They make money. The problem with this is that this, bless you. The the markets for this are very short lived. So the bad guys are really in an interesting uh, pickle. They have data that's worth something, but how they get rid of it can be very tough. Trade secrets are even worse. If you're getting proprietary info from an organization and trying to sell that, good luck. I hope that you're a state-sponsored group if you're going into that. Um, by the way, Internet, don't do that. Mick is not saying that you should be... Uh, state sponsored, that's bad. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, it's, it's actually hard to make money as a bad guy. That's the whole point of this slide. They're very unpredictable. When it comes to ransomware, though, boy, is that nice. Those bits of ransomware, when that stager, when the launcher goes active, 
it phone homes and says, hey, I'm about to do the nastiness, they will track that and they know what the install rate is. Then they can start tracking that particular account and seeing, hey, are they paying up or not? And then they can also start playing around and doing analytics with how many Bitcoin do we charge? And you might say to yourself, wow, that's really wild. We see that at Binary Defense. One of the things that our threat intel group does is they will infiltrate um, these dark markets and these uh, hacker groups, and they will see the discussions on, well, we should be asking for three Bitcoin. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's go two here. Uh, what about two per host, you know, et cetera. It's crazy, but they're actually seeing this and treating this as if you were a regular MBA trying to do profit maximization. It's really sobering. So don't get hung up on the fact that they're bad guys. Be thinking of the fact that they're doing some really crazy, interesting uh, shenanigans. Now, another thing that's really bizarre, if you think about it, is malware authors. One of the reasons that we're seeing such a proliferation of ransomware is that the malware authors, for the first time in a very, very long time, now have an incentive to write more code. Used to be if you wrote your toolkit, you wrote your attack tool, bad guys would have it and they're off to the races, they're good to go. Now, the authors, what, one thing to point out is the people who write these sorts of toolkits are almost never the people who conduct the campaign. What they do is they will make the ransomware and then they will sell it on a dark market and lease or say, hey, you know, here's this particular bit of malware that you can use. Antivirus companies and other signature-based tools are always on the lookout for these sorts of tools because, or these sorts of attack tools because they're so problematic for their clients. So as a result, what they do is they make signatures and they block it. Well, the bad the, the authors, the bad guy authors, now love this because they can resell that same tool tweaked around slightly to the bad guys and they now are having an ongoing revenue stream. It used to be that you would write a tool and you were pretty much done. Now, they, hey, okay, cool, well, you like that one, here's the next installment. So, as a result, we've got all kinds of weird, perverse, economics that are going on, and we in the defensive side aren't really doing a good job, I think, of understanding those economics. And so we're saying, well, you know, we're going to uh, do good enough defense. We only have to be faster than the bad, the, the um, worst person. Uh, I was, when I was first getting into InfoSec, I was at a conference, and this one guy was like, well, you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun the person that you're hiking with. You guys, how many folks have heard people talking about that within the InfoSec community? Come on, raise your hand, seriously. Yeah, so there's a lot of folks that are hearing that, and a lot of organizations have that approach. But you know what? That no longer hunts. There's now people who are just writing malware for you. Doesn't matter how good or fast everybody else is, it's just for you, or for you, or for you, or for you. And it's time just let it sit. So now we've got a situation where we've got ongoing attacks that are seeding the minefield for us and just sitting back and waiting. So the results of this is that there's a lot of money in this. This is not going away. I was really wrong. And so you need to start understanding that this is not the traditional form of hacking where people are doing, like, taking your systems for a joyride. They're not trying to tamper with the data. They just want money. How you defend against this is different than the attackers that you used to defend against. So, why are we getting beaten? We have lost our way. If you... Like, we're able to cryogenically freeze a systems administrator or a, uh, like a real competent security admin from like the mid 90s and then flash thaw them out today, they would freak out. <laughs> they would. And I'll be honest, like, I've been in this career long enough that I've, I've, you know, grown up with some of my mentors and they're just like straight angry. 
Because they're like, what do you mean you don't do X, Y, Z? And I'm like, well, I don't know. It's software-defined networking. Back off. And they're like, no, this is craziness. And you know what? They're right. We have lost our way. I have a shirt, and you'll see if you're at DerbyCon, you'll see me wearing this shirt. It's a cloud, and it's got like a zipper on its mouth, and it says the cloud is just someone else's computer. And yet, we somehow think, oh, we're going to push it to the cloud, save a lot of money. Well, what are you doing for access controls? Cloud. No, that's not access control. And yet, we think somehow that just because it's somebody else's system, it's not our problem. All we need to do is get back to the basics. We've lost our way. And so if you want this slide deck, come up and see me or send me an email. I'll, I'll be happy to share it with you. These next couple slides are things that I'm passionate about, and I'm totally confused that we've lost our way. Patches. Missing patches. Are there any, any ransomwares out there that are using zero days? No. No. In fact, I saw one that I was working with a couple months ago that it was a three-and-a-half-year-old vulnerability. Okay, you know what? I admit that we as an industry pretty much stink at applying patches, but three-and-a-half years? Come on! If you don't have automated uh, testing of your environment, you are just begging to get kicked in the teeth. And the thing that kills me is there's a lot of organizations that when patches come, they're like, oh, we don't know that might affect fraud. Well, you know what? There was a tool released in the very late 90s by the Apache Foundation called JMeter. Look into it. JMeter is a Java-based applet that allows you to, or application, that allows you to record and rerun transactions. Doesn't matter if it's web-based, doesn't matter if it's a database transaction, doesn't matter if it's an MQ, you can rerun those transactions and know with absolute certainty that the patch does or does not break your environment. And it's free. It costs literally nothing. You can also use it as a load test tool. It's one of the best kept secrets in information security and information technology. Apache JMeter is awesome. You should be able to know within minutes of how fast you can apply patches. We have one client that I'm super proud of at BDS. Um, their patch cycle from when Microsoft releases a patch to when they can know that it will work on all production systems, I'm not kidding folks, eight and a half hours. Fully automated, 100% certainty, and it just works. Core configurations. Yeah. Question. What is the name of the tool again? The tool's name is JMeter, that is J as in Juliet, and then meter, like the meter stick, and it's from Apache. They have a great wiki, there's tons of awesome material out there. You can also use it for a load tester. That's actually how I first um, uh, fell into it. I was an F5 uh, load balance admin at the time, and I used it to uh, stress test our environment. And then I was like, hey, you can rerun transactions through this thing. And I, I was like, oh, this is great. Can't wait to tell the community. And then I saw, like, they had, here's how you do patch management with JMeter. And I was like, oh. <laughs> so it's a great tool. Poor configurations. Oh. All right. If you know a pen tester, like, hug them and say it's going to be okay, because this is where most pen testers live, is they check for weird configuration flaws in your environment. If you're not having somebody check your configurations for you, uh, the bad guys are. They're just not sharing the results. So do the pen test. Do the scans. Check your configurations. Use the Center for Internet Security guideline. How many folks have read these documents? Please put your hand up if you've read them. All right. Hands down. If you've not read of them or not heard of them, don't feel bad. They don't have a big advertising budget. It's a not-for-profit organization. Go out, download these benchmark tools. Please promise me that you're not going to be operating heavy machinery while you read the benchmarks. They are dry, boring, and dull. However, at the end of running through one of the benchmark templates, you will have an OS that will bring a pen tester to frustrated tears. There's benchmarks for every operating system, application, et cetera, that is not homebrewed in your environment. Get them. Uh, weak account hygiene. 
This is one of those ones where the graybeards that had you froze from the mid-90s and thawed them out, they would have lost their mind. It used to be that we were pretty good as in, in industry in not having shared accounts, not having shared um, passwords. Boy, have services really messed that up. As a pen tester, sometime pen tester, let me tell you, I love going after weak account hygiene. There ain't nothing like unauthorized, authorized access, if you know what I mean. So make sure that people aren't sharing accounts. Make sure that the passwords are strong. Make sure that you tease your users that passwords are dead. At 3 o'clock, there's going to be a guy, I think in this room actually, Martin Bose, who's with my sister company, Trusted Sec. And he, every year, uh, participates in the Crack Me If You Can Challenge at DEF CON. <coughs> Last year, not this summer, but the year before that, he and his team cracked a 22-character password in three days. Ouch. You've got to get better on account hygiene. You've got to start doing what you need to do to, to defend those. Monitoring is the one that always brings me to tears when I come in and do a, a case against Crypto Locker. People will come to me and they'll say, Mick, we had no idea that they were in our network. Really? Really? You didn't know that you had a workstation that was doing other workstation to workstation traffic? Well, we weren't looking there. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, you didn't know that you had a, a user in your environment that was enumerating all the network shares, all the file shares that it could, and started incrementally going through every single file? No. Really? Because here in your event log is where I'm seeing this take place. Look at your logs. This is ridiculous. I've also got some uh, uh, suspect we'll talk about uh, is a very handy uh, tool for that. But there's also other command lines. You don't have to just take me, uh, my tools. There's, there's plenty of other things out there that will help you find it. Bad backup practice. Please back up. And uh, this tears my heart out. Last week, I was up in, uh, at a company, and they were like, well, we have backups. And I'm like, sweet, let's take a look at your backups. It was a USB drive attached to the server. <laughs> CryptoLocker found it. So they had backup of the cryptographic stuff. Do your backups. It kills me, it kills me that auditors now have pretty much stopped validating that backups are real. I remember back in the early 2000s, the, the Ernst & Young's and other accounting firms were real sticklers on this. They just don't care anymore. Start like caring about this. Hug your backup admin. Be on the lookout for phishing. A lot of the um, malware, these sorts of ransomware, comes in via phishing. If you held a gun to a pen tester's head and said, hey, you've got to get access to a network, number one thing they're going to say is phishing. Now, I, I'm going to get a little rantier than normal even on this. It's, a lot of organizations, when I go in and I say, hey, they fished you, this is how this malware happened, you know, here's the timeline, and they're like, oh, those users, mmm, mmm, users, 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 <laughs> You know what? I'll be the first to admit, I used to do that. Um, I've changed my tune. Here's why. Um, so, my dad worked in a steel mill. Very dangerous place. And if somebody's walking on a catwalk and they're not harnessed in correctly, they're going to fall to their death. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You fall 110 feet onto concrete, you smush. If somebody falls off of the catwalk, they'll be like, man, Bob kind of sucked. But if at that same catwalk, a week later, somebody else falls over, they don't start blaming the users. They start blaming the catwalk the harness, the process. Phishing now is our problem as technologists. It's not a user problem. I don't know what the fix is. I got some ideas. We can jam on it after the talk. But you can't blame the users anymore. You've got to do a better job of protecting them. Drive-by download. You know, it used to be when your uncle or some neighborhood friend or family friend came to you and said, 
hey, I got all these pop-ups appearing on my computer, and you'd be like, oh, and where were you surfing? <laughs> right? You guys know that, yeah. Um, or maybe you were the one that was like, man, all these pop-ups, that's weird. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. Google is serving up malicious ads. Not all the time, but the bad guys will figure out how to get around that. Um, uh, Major League Baseball was serving up malware. PBS was serving up, yeah, PBS, like the public television station, people leave us Mr. Rogers, is serving up malware from time to time. So we need to start whitelisting internet sites only. And I see you guys might, internet whitelisting, bad! Not so. Uh, a real easy way to do internet whitelisting, or at least to cut down the risk potential, is Amazon bought Alexa, which is a marketing firm. The Alexa Top Million is released every three days, freely available. That is a list of the top million DNS sites, or sites that people go to on the internet, ranked from number one, which is almost always Facebook, all the way down to one million. What I'm asking you to do, and this is a hack that I learned from John Strand, a mentor of mine. Take some number, 10,000, 5,000, 20,000, I don't care. Say, all right, here's the cutoff. Everything above this, automatically whitelisted. You want to go to Facebook? Good luck, God bless. Now, if your organization wants to be a little tighter than that, awesome. But what I'm saying is you can do internet whitelisting, say the top 10,000 up, automatically allowed, no questions asked, and you will have a drastic impact on the amount of drive-by downloads. If you just could fix these two things, your organization is going to be sitting real pretty. Real pretty. Question? Yes, sir. You must be the top 10,000 safe websites. Well, no. I'm actually being a little more... There's a four-letter word that starts with a P, and I know there's some of those in that top 10,000. So here's the deal, though. <laughs> so we're talking about adult content. The, the comment is, are, are you going to allow the adult content sites into, a, uh, into an organization? Probably not. I'll be honest. But I will tell you this. We've done a lot of analysis, and the ones that make it to that grade are not doing the shady stuff. They are legitimate businesses that are fulfilling a need. <laughs> and, uh, sorry, to, sorry to make a little fun of that, but that, that's the case. The, the folks that are fairly high up in, in that list are fairly legit. Now, here's another thing. You, you guys might be saying, well, but Mick, you know, our organization, we might have something that's at like at 100,000 or maybe not even on the top million list at all, and they need it for business use. Totally cool. Absolutely. Here's what you do. You allow any user to contact the help desk and say, my name is so-and-so, I need this site, and here's why. And they can give whatever reason they want. And you record that stuff. There isn't an auditor that I've talked to that has said boo to that. Because all you need to do is track somebody said that they needed it, why they needed it, and what they needed and you're good to go. I know some organizations that go so far as to actually have a system where the help desk can unblock that site themselves. I don't know if I'd go that far, but, you know, it, it's something to ponder. So why, why would you allow somebody to, I mean, my, my premise is, like, I've got to clean up the mess later, yep. so why would I let that guy access that site that I might have to do all the work to clean up later? So the, the comment is, why would you allow somebody to go to a site that could infect them? Um, my comment is, if you've got whitelisting and you've got it really tight, you're good. A lot of organizations don't, though. We go to organizations and we say, what's your internet usage? And they're like, whatever. And it shocks me. What I'm saying is, those who are doing Wild Wild West, whatever you want to go to on the internet, these days are dying. And you can make a good argument to an organization by saying, this is the line in the sand we're going to draw. Everything else and above, automatically permitted. And by and large, most of those people are fairly good. Like, they're not causing the problems. I mean, to be sure, Major League Baseball, Google, etc., are going to be targets for drive-by download. 
But what you're really doing with this is you're blocking the people, like especially the fishers, that will set up a domain and start a phishing campaign literally minutes later. So doing just that will have a dramatic impact. Awesome question today. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Great. All right. So next item. Any code can run. Why? Are you kidding me? Antivirus should be dead. And the reason it should be dead is we should be whitelisting only the applications that end users should be doing. And I know this sounds crazy. There's a lot of organizations that this might not be terribly practical for your entire user group. But for certain communities, it's worth fighting this fight. Restrict the applications that they can run to the set that they need for their business. That's it. A different client of ours who's crazy, they're absolutely bonkers, came up with a very interesting setup with Windows App Locker. And they said, hey, what if we did a situation where we made Microsoft an untrusted publisher? And I was like, what? Like, the OS won't run. And they're like, well, no. What we're going to do is we will whitelist the applications needed for day-to-day -day use for a particular user. And then admins who have their GPO uh, policies that allow them to run things like command.exe and powershell.exe, etc. They're good to go, but normal users are only able to run like office applications and use their web browser, and that's about it. I'm here to tell you that whenever somebody gets that pen test contract at uh, TrustedSec or at other companies that I we chat with them about, they start swearing softly. Because imagine as a pen tester, when you can't even pop open cmd.exe. You can win this fight. It's actually not that hard to profile user executables, especially now with PowerShell. Um, this is a module within Suspect that I'll, I'll be talking about. Um, unrestricted network traffic. Oh. Um, egress controls. Folks, remember that firewalls work both ways? Please. Users should only be allowed out on 80 and 443, and that's about it. Um, hopefully, they're actually only going to your proxy, and they don't have any internet out. It's all going through your proxy, and that's it. Um, watch for workstation to workstation traffic. If you don't have the ability to see workstation to workstation traffic, your job is a lot harder than it needs to be. Now, to be sure, there are times that workstation to workstation traffic is legit and expected. But that should be relatively rare in your organization, and you should be able to account for that and know about it. Finally, get antivirus. I have now worked five cases in the past quarter where we have had uh, companies that were getting hit by CryptoLocker, and the reason that they found out that CryptoLocker was running wild in their organization is the antivirus engine was triggering on different points in their network saying, hey, these machines have crypto locker. And I was like, well, what about those machines? Aren't they running AV? And they're like, oh, well, they can. Really? Like, if antivirus is too tough for you, like, I don't really know what to say. Because, like, antivirus is not a very good defense. You know, we know that it's easy to bypass. Um, but, man, like, it, it's not a hard thing to sell. It's not hard to set up. Finally, the next two items that I want to talk about are file permissions. Why does everyone have full control on your network shares? Now, you might be better than that, and if so, give yourself a pat on the back. But one of the things that kills me is if you have full control, there is a special little twist of the knife that the bad guys are able to do to you when they're doing a crypto locker attack, and we'll delve into that in a couple of slides. Don't give full control. It allows them to alter the timestamps. And they, they do that to evade detection. So don't give full control. If somebody needs to write, give them write. They need, only need read, only give them read. File detect, uh, file audit. Windows has one of the best, and it, this may, like, this is coming from somebody who has been paid to use Unix since 1997. Windows has spectacular file auditing. In fact, it's one of the better things about the OS. Turn it on. For the love of God, turn it on. <laughs> Be targeted. Don't, don't turn on everywhere. 
Has anybody turned it on on the entire like C drive? Like I've done that. What, what happens when you do that? Too much noise, the system slows down to a crawl, and in some cases the magic smoke comes out of the computer. So be aware there is a system impact. There are a lot of articles out there where people will say, don't turn it on. Don't turn it on everywhere. Be targeted. If you've got a folder where your crown jewels are, turn it on. You should know who's looking at these sort of uh, elements. Feed it into a sim. Feed it into a log management tool of some sort. Any questions so far? Am I saying crazy stuff? Is this stuff that you haven't heard before? No. Sir? You mentioned only allow certain programs to run. Yes. Underneath. That would be only digitally signed programs that you recognize? So the, the question is, um, for application whitelisting, only allowing certain applications to run. There's multiple ways that you can uh, allow applications to run. The easiest, and believe me, this, this is a low-cost, simple, easy way to go, is just say, we're going to allow this directory. Executables from this directory can run. And then you prevent who can write to that directory so that any user can't overwrite or put malicious stuff in there. That's a real easy win. Then the next one is uh, trusted publishers or trusted executables. So there's multiple ways, ways of doing it. And that works until our government gives the internet ICANN and the Chinese start dropping in, you know, trusted... Ah, okay, so, so yes, so that's, that's an excellent comment, uh, an excellent comment. The concern is um, who's, who's trusted and what CAs. Please, if you followed Wait, where is it? Here, if you followed this, the Center for Internet Security Guideline, one of the things for every Windows operating system, and one of the things for every Linux operating system, and for every Mac, which, hey, that covers just about everything, tells you to review your certificate trusts. Please review your certificate trusts. For a while, the, the um, Hong Kong Post Office was a certificate authority. Like, and I'm not making that up. Like, that was a real thing. So you need to review that. Um, most organizations have those uh, that have those locked down are in real good shape. It's not hard to do, and it's very uh, that's a fight you can win. Great question. Any other questions? All right. Now we're going to move into the more detection side of the house. Look for encrypted files. This is a lot easier than you may think it is. Um, Normal files, if you think about them, have a character distribution set that is, quite frankly, boring. It looks something like this in the English language. This is letter frequency of, I think it was a snapshot of Wikipedia at a particular time. Programmatically, this is very easy to detect. Encrypted files as long as they're not doing like a substitution cipher, like where they're doing modern cryptography, that file, that letter frequency will be flat. It will look all the same because they're making it so that you can't do letter analysis against that, letter substitution analysis. So be on the lookout for files that claim to be dot .text but have a character frequency that doesn't match what you would expect. And that's a feature within uh, Suspect, but we'll be talking about in a bit. Um, look out for Mac time offsets. This is one of the things that sets my hair on fire. It gets me so angry. I love the NTFS, the Microsoft file system. There's better ones if you want to talk like file system holy wars. We can talk about that. But there are some really, really neat features in NTFS. And one of them is the MAC timestamps, the modified access create, modified access create. Those three timestamps are on every single file, but there's actually two sets. So you have one set that is exposed to normal user land. If you have full control on a file, you can alter these timestamps. That's what a lot of the malware is doing, is they will take that MAC time and they will encrypt a file, and the MAC time is different. They will backdate it to what that file was prior 
to when they started messing with it. But there's a problem. And this is a glorious problem because we as the defenders can capitalize on this. There's another set that is kernel only. Microsoft has not released this API. Nobody knows how to alter those timestamps. All you need to do is look and see if those timestamps match up. If they don't, that's weird. There's an amazing, an amazing blog posting on this. Not the year, 2014. We've known about how to detect this sort of thing for a while. It's a great tool. You can run it in your organization on a fairly frequent basis. Most of the organizations, I encourage them to run this on an hourly case against their file shares if they're really scared about um, cryptoware attacks. It's really dead simple. It's available on GitHub. If you read, read the blog post that was on the prior slide, there's a link at the bottom that points you to this. Depending on your version of PowerShell, you may need to import another time stamp reading feature. But um, you, what you can do is look for these time stamp offsets. Now, I'll be honest, um, there are times that you will get false positives. There are certain like bulk editing tools that will do the same thing. But once you whitelist and account for them, you're good to go. This doesn't cost you a thin dime. Also, be able to look out for processes that use too much I.O. Windows has a pretty OK instrumentation set called Perfmon. You can look for average reads and average writes that take place over a time period. And if they go over too high of a threshold, you can take action on that of your choosing. An easy way to look at this to see what your top most um, uh, uh, resource uh, intensive in terms of file handles, uh, files or systems are, you would do this. Git process, sort descending, select process name, resources, that's a typo, that should be name, N-A-M-E. And then resources and select first 10. That will tell you the top 10 most file reading and writing executables. Now, if that's something that you don't know on that system, that's something to investigate. Little by the by, here's a neat thing. You can do git process dash computer name, and this will run remote. So you can scan your entire domain and do this very, very easily. We're running low on time, so what I'll do is I'll just chat about this for a little bit. There's a tool that I, I'm writing called Suspect that I've mentioned a couple times. Um, it's on GitHub. It's private right now because it's break. Um, but what I'm doing is, with this, it will monitor the processes that are running on your system. It will check the hashes of the executable and the DLLs that are being called by it. And I'm hoping to have it probably really soon. Realistically, it'll probably be Q2. Um, but it's really, really cool. It will find when you've got a new process running. This, this mode will actually help you build up your application whitelisting using AppLocker or whatever, whatever application whitelisting tool you have. Um, it will also look for files that are over too high of an I.O. threshold. So it will look at what the average I.O. and then the max I.O. is for that process over a given time frame. And then it's using the um, uh, PowerShell internals tool to suspend the process, and then you can unfreeze it. That way, if you accidentally have a false positive, you know, Western civilization doesn't end, you can just unfreeze that process, and life is good for everyone. So, hopefully, you know, shoot me an email. That's my real email. Don't spam me. Um, uh, other than that, thank you for your time. I appreciate the questions. If you guys got other questions, let me know. And then afterwards, I'll be out in the hall. <laughs> By the way, thank the videographers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.